Let's do it. Live stream. We are live streaming. Yeah. All around the world. It's global. Happy Friday. I'm going to kick this off. And welcome to Accelerating Brand Value with Influencers, The Road to Relevance. I'm Dana Long. I head up the digital and the influencer practice at Golan Digital. We're an integrated communications agency with digital content, PR, and influencer marketing at our core. Tiffany Everett, our director of digital, is going to kick off the panel and do formal introductions. But before she does that, I'd love to show you um, a sizzle of our work at Golan and some of the engaging influencer campaigns that we do. for coming. Um, I'm going to jump in and start introducing our panel. So Man and Matthews has become, can you guys hear me, one of the internet's most popular female comedian stars with over 3.5 million followers. She'll be starring in the upcoming YouTube Red series Single by 30, was recently featured as a finalist on TBS's Funniest Wins, and will appear in this season of Broad City. Manon also starred in the indie romantic comedy Holiday Breakup. She has studied at all of the top improvisational schools across LA and worked with top brands such as Bud Light, Coke, Jeep, Best Buy, and Nordstrom. So we have a little short video clip of some of Manon's work. Matthews. There'll be a test at the end of this, though. started his entertainment career right out of high school. At age 17, he was hired by Radio Disney in Portland, Oregon to host live events. After five years of hosting, Matt decided to pursue his passion for music and started a pop rock band, It Boys. Matt fronted the band as lead vocalist and led them to success with three years of international touring and radio play. Their song, Guys Don't Like Me, peaked at number four on the series Radio Hits One Countdown. Due to label complications, Matt had to break up the band in 2013. A year after the breakup, Matt joined Vine. Within the last two years, Matt has grown exponentially on his social platforms, including Instagram, Vine, Twitter, Snapchat, and Facebook, to a total reach of over 2.5 million followers. Matt is now considered one of the top social media influencers, creating branded content for numerous Fortune 500 companies including Verizon, McDonald's, Disney, Amazon, Hewlett Packard, Starbucks, Toyota, and Budweiser. So we'll jump into um, a video short clip of 
Matt's best work, <laughs> um, and some stuff that he did with us at Golan. The first video, um, it, it jumps into a second part, so I'll just tease it a little bit. Um, there, actually, go ahead and show it, and then I can probably explain it better. Or Matt can explain it. to help promote um, one of our clients, uh, Nintendo, for one of their games, Star Fox. Uh, also joining me on the panel today is my Golan colleague, Kristen Barry Owen, who is VP of Research and Analytics. She'll give us some insight on the analytical filters Golan uses in the influencer section process and how that has advanced the brand campaigns that we work on. So that's your panel, so let's jump in. Um, I want to begin um, and ask Matt and Manon if they can describe in their own words, what does an influencer mean to you and how did you kind of get started in this business? Uh, for me personally, um, I was working as an actress and um, a stand-up comedian and I started making these videos and so to me an influencer means somebody who's constantly creating on a daily basis to have engagement on their following and um, you know, in the beginning, brand starts coming, and then we, we uh, basically an influencer is a person who has a social media following that creates content for brands. I mean, yeah. I actually think I think the word and title influencer is an interesting title that we that we were given. I think an influencer in general is anyone who has any sort of influence on people, whether it be uh, an athlete or an actor or a musician or a social media star. I think that word has just been given to us because we have a day-to-day -day influence that reaches out to people on what we wear, what we eat, um, what bike we ride, what car we drive. So I think that's why we've entitled that. But I've always, that word's kind of weird to me. It is Being weird. called an influencer yeah. is kind of weird. It's, it's interesting, but I think, I think just anyone of influence. And it's varied too, right? So people say content creator um, as well. And so, you know, with the, increase in, we'll just use the word influencer for the sake of this panel, um, influencers and brands wanting to partner, you know, there's value in understanding why brands want to partner with influencers. Um, so consumers have developed you know, deep connections with online creators and personalities that they follow, and when marketers partner with these influencers, people see the brand through the eyes of someone they trust. Um, in June 2016, Variety released an article noting that while awareness of digital talent is still quite low in comparison to top TV stars, their engagement rate is stronger than most sectors of the celebrity universe. So, um, Kristen, can you give us some insight on why this is? Yeah, well, first of all, just to clarify that, uh, I think that's based off a USC study that showed that influencers um, have five times the influence that celebrities have. Um, you know, looking at the millennial and teen market, 71% agree that influencers are changing the culture. 75% go to influencers for advice or for information, and I think that's an important distinction because that means that people are actually turning to them instead of just uh, inactively being in, uh, influenced by them. And then 60% say that influencers impact what they buy, um, which is, I know, important to a lot of our clients. Um, but when we look at um, the influencers that we look at, um, our ultimate goal is to make someone or a brand or a product more relevant to the audience, to consumers. And these influencers that we work with are really considered accelerators of relevance because not only do they have the authority and cred credibility in a specific space, they also have a strong enough voice to drive cultural conversation. Great. Um, so part of the partnership between you know, brands and influencers really is that creative side of it. So um, I want to get Manon and Matt's take on, you know, as a creator, how do you like to partner with brands and what determines a positive brand partnership for you guys? Sure. Um, I know for myself a positive partnership with a brand would be the brand understanding um, us as influencers, our style of comedy, and what, we, what kind of product that we can relate to. Uh, it's very difficult when you work with a brand who doesn't understand your style of humor or they try to get 
very creative and write stuff for you. I was on a set where um, I had my script ready and flew to New York for it. It was kind of a big campaign. And the director was completely changing who I am and what I do. And the content just didn't end up that, that, that good. But they hired me to play me, which I was giving my best. Um, and they could totally change it. So I think, I think understanding the influencer. I think the brand and agency need to understand that and trust us on how to make something funny um, for, their, for their brand. Absolutely. And, it, and when it becomes as close to something that we actually would you know, consume or have in our daily lives, it's easier to create content for that. You know, it's not, we don't, people don't want to have anything shoved down their throats. They right. want to feel like it's an organic process. And so, you know, it's, it's important that the brands trust us as creators. You know, we got the following for a reason. Mm -hmm. and it's like, just kind of do your thing. And I'm sure that, you know, pe pe the clients are, are uh, used to the old ways of advertising mm -hmm. where it's very showy. And, and we like to have it more organic because no one wants to feel immediate. When the minute they know it's an ad, it's like a little cringy. Yeah. And the, if we can avoid that and make it fun and make it look like we're enjoying it, yeah. that's, the, you know, the better. There's a reason why a brand or agency like us would be going to you. Otherwise, you know, do an ad buy, basically. So, yeah. So totally agree. Um, so share with us the benefits that you've seen from, like, an ongoing relationship with a brand or its representing agency. So is there, like, a brand you've had a relationship with for a while, you've done some work with them? Kind of what makes that work? Can you talk closer to can you tell us um, kind of what works from an ongoing relationship standpoint from a brand that you've worked with for a long time? Sure. Um, I know for me, um, I think it actually helps when it's a longevity thing where it's like, okay, now they're like, I'm the spokesperson for this company. And so people are a lot more forgiving because they're just accepted like, oh, cool. She's the, you know, as far, you know, we, we all know the T-Mobile girl or the mm -hmm. at t girl. It's, it's kind of fun because it's like, oh, we know this and we've attached that. So instead of doing like 10 different, you know, beer companies, it's nice to have one. And, right. you know, and I know for me that that's been really beneficial with sticking with longevity. I agree. I think the longer, I think the longer campaigns are more beneficial because um, you, you as the brand, you as the influencer and the brand get to know each other more. You get in a rhythm of things. You know what to expect. You know how to promote the product. You've done a couple tests to see what worked and what didn't work, and it can actually just it gets better over time. And uh, like Manon was saying, I've I've recently got a large campaign. And I enjoy doing it now. I created characters for it. It, it developed into a thing to where I've, I've done maybe 10 social media posts so far. Mm -hmm. And the campaign does well. And now I don't mind doing posts for the specific brand because my audience is used to it. They like the skits that I do for it. And I think, I think a long-term partnership is, is very valuable. Nice. Not to mention the trust. You know, they start mm -hmm. to trust you and right. let you yeah. be more free creatively, which mm -hmm. is really great for us. Awesome. Um, so just... Continuing along the lines of you know creativity, uh, once you have the green light on a brand partnership, you know what do you do next creatively? Like, give us some insight into you know the back end, what we don't see once you've like signed the dotted line and you're you know creating your concept. I think that's probably different between me and Man and any <laughs> other influencer. For myself, um, wake up, have a cup of coffee. I gotta have my coffee. Um, and I actually have a business partner, um, Fernando, who kind of co-creates with me and we just kind of bounce ideas off each other. Like, okay, we have this new, let's just say it's the new iPad and they want to show that the iPad does this and we'll walk around and kind of like riff off of each other and do our own like improv skits um, with each other to see what comes up that's funny based on the product and what we have to give. Uh -huh. um, it, so it, it totally depends. I think that everyone brainstorms differently and works differently, but um, having a business partner who's in this with me helps a lot. He's also a, f a funny guy. Um, sometimes even, you know, me and Manon will help each other with, with each other's uh, brand deals and work, and sometimes we'll just get together and, and just kind of laugh and brainstorm and look at the product and think of something funny. Right. But, I mean, that's for me at least. Yeah, it, ev it evolves when you are collaborating. I know I, I would come in with an idea. This happened like a year ago where I came in with an idea and then you kind of helped it evolve into something even better. So the more we can collaborate, the better, because I know for me, a lot of the time, most of the time, I'll, I'll have a cup of coffee and uh, you know I'll see pictures in my head and then write down the concepts. We'll come up with about, it depends on how many concepts they want, you know, five videos or five uh, photos depending on what they want and send them in and then they come back and pick one and 
you know, yeah, it's definitely better with help and with collaboration. Um, I know I get really excited when they partner Matt and I together or me and a friend, and it's not just a solo mm -hmm. campaign. It's mm -hmm. like we want you to include this other influencer. Other people you know. Yeah, yeah the more like the merrier. Relationship there. Yeah, for sure. I, I do think brands need to um, understand the importance of a partnership. Um, for instance, me and Man do a lot of work together. Our chemistry is great um, on camera, and we our, our humor is the same. So if a brand, if a car company wants to partner me with someone, and they watch our content and study it, me and Man are a great fit for that, and we can come up with something funny, relatable. People love the guy girl comedy. Uh, a lot of people don't look that deep into it. They just think they want numbers. So let's mm -hmm. hire this person, this person, and then they go off and do separate campaigns instead of bringing a large audience together which I think is important. So do you guys sometimes recommend each other? Like if a brand comes to you and says, like, this is kind of what we want. We might have another influencer. Like, do you know anybody? Yeah. Do you guys kind of mm -hmm. recommend each other? That's awesome. Um, so at Golan, we've identified influencers to be, um, you know, leveraged across all media types and industries, including traditional media, the event space, social media, um, and promotions. Can you share the coolest campaign that was outside of the box from what you usually do? I can think of one off the top of my head. I guess this wouldn't be, this would be outside the box I think for most influencers because a lot of people don't have um, experience with interviews, but I did used to work for Radio Disney and interview um, talent, so it was right up my alley, but definitely outside the box for most people. I actually just flew back last night from uh, Cozumel, Mexico, and they, I was flown out there to do a live, uh, a Facebook live interview with Sam Hunt, he's a country star. And that's outside the box because it was, it was a brand deal for Carnival Cruise, and he played on the Carnival Cruise um, that night. And it was just different, and it was unique, and it wasn't just me um, on my street or my living room or like, you know, shooting with product. I got to fly somewhere and, and interview someone. and So that was kind of a unique outside-the-box one, and I think, I think brands should think a little bit more outside-the-box when it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, I know it's very different because there was a celebrity involved, but I feel like there's a lot of campaigns that do have celebrities involved, like me and Manon did one for uh, American Express, and we got to go shoot with, um, what was his name? Joel McHale. Joel McHale, thank you. Uh, <laughs> From we, the we audience. Shot, which was cool because Joel McHale was a partner, myself and Manon, and so we got to create together, and the content was great, because all three of us are comedians, and I think that's, I think that's pretty important. And that was, a, that was kind of an outside the box campaign as well, the, the AMX one. Yeah, I knew I, I had one for a beer company early this year, and I got to go to the Super Bowl, which felt amazing. Nice. I got to bring my dad, who's like a huge nice. football fan, never thought I'd ever get to go to the Super Bowl. Yeah. And it's the same company that I've been with, uh, was with uh, for longevity purposes, and I also went to South by Southwest. And if you can create an experience, so it's not just about the product, mm -hmm. it's about the experience that you're having with the product, whether it's a, a you know, an event on Snapchat or you know, just sharing your, your, your life, because that's what they're really seeing. They're viewing our, what they think, you know, if it's a fake sketch or if it's real or it's what, whatever it is, it's, they want to be a part of our lives because they're yeah. checking in on us. And if they're knowing, you know, man, it's at the Super Bowl with such and such company, yeah. they get excited and that, they, that feeling, that energy resonates with the product, yeah, which is absolutely. great on an unconscious level. It's like, mm -hmm. you want to create an experience, you know? And I, I love those trips because mm -hmm. it's not just, hey, make a video with, you know, whatever, it's, it's go have fun. We want to see you in your light and in your humor at this event. Right, Agreed. so right. totally. This is totally off track, but I have a question just in hearing you say that. Like, do your, does your family and close friends get what you guys do? Because I'm sure like your dad's like, yeah, this YouTube thing's paying off. I'm going to the Super Bowl now. Like, do they, do they get it? Do they get this concept of it? I think so. I, I mean, I think for me, I've definitely, it's been so fun to get to include you know, my friends and things, yeah, and bringing my great. friend to Australia, and my dad to the Super Bowl, and my friend to Austin, like, we get to, we get to include our friends, which is what, you know, I think it's smart that the, the clients Very smart. do that, yeah. and, and allow that, because if we do it on our own, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to interact and have something mm -hmm. funny that's just by ourselves, we need people to play off of. There's yeah. definitely times where we've shot together where you're the straight man and I'm the goofy one and vice versa because we, you know, we need that bouncing board for the, right. the audience to relate to. So I think, I, I don't know if they fully get it. I don't even know if I fully get it. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's bizarre. Yeah. 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 It's, a weird it's, new, it's a weird new world, but yeah. we're, all trying to, we're all trying to understand it. That's why we're here. Um, <laughs> Kristen, do you uh, want to talk a little bit about kind of Golan's methodology for influencer identification? Okay. Yeah, for everything from identification to measurement. So we 
Um, we do this, as I said before, to make a, bro a brand or a product more relevant to people. And so when we begin, we look at who, who the audience is, of course, and do our research there and build um, an influencer ecosphere for that particular consumer so we understand who's out there. And then we have metrics for adjudicating that, maybe a short list of that, and we look at um, how well they would be as accelerators, as I mentioned before, and those are kind of the traditional metrics that you um, either already employ or, or know about, and um, that's reach and engagement level. And then we look at relevance, so are they influencers of influencers? Um, are they relevant to the brand? Do they have brands uh, that they work with who mesh with our brand identity? Um, and you know, would they play in the sandbox well together to make sure that, again, we're you know, at every level striving for some authenticity here, um, for it to make sense um, that we're using and working with people um, who share you know, similar ideas, similar values, similar um, attributes. And then the third area is receptivity or relationship. So um, are they going to be receptive to working with these brands or products? Um, is that kind of, it, could that be a somewhat organic relationship? Do they already have a relationship with these brand, brands? So that's kind of how we uh, start our selection process and evaluate working with people. And then, of course, we've got ongoing measurement that we use to make sure that we're, we're tracking um, the reach and engagement there, and those are pretty quantitative. And then at the, at the end, and for next time, we have um, an influencer quality scoring that looks at both qualitative and quantitative measures to make sure that um, we're looking at the content. Um, and, and, um, and one thing I wanted to point out about the co-creation with a brand, yeah. one of the reasons why influencers have such a big impact on people, on their audiences, is because audience have a real stake. They feel like, especially younger audiences, feel like they're contributing to the content, they're contributing to the su success of the influencer. Um, they often feel like um, that influencer gets them, um, they can identify with them, and so in the same way that um, they, are, they have a good relationship because the audience feels like they have a stake, that in turn is similar for influencers having a good relationship with an agency or brands because everybody has a stake and everybody's working together. So one of the metrics in our quality scoring um, is that kind of co-creation. Um, percent of content that is branded versus just the um, influencers organic content. So there are a lot of different measures that we look at um, so that at the end we can see you know how well is it going with that influencer and last as I mentioned before um, the whole reason why we do this is to be more relevant with consumers so if we have some lift in brand relevance that spells success. Yeah, so to Matt's point, like gone are the days of brands or agencies just going on a social media site and seeing how many followers or subscribers someone has. Like you really have to dig deep, like what's their engagement? Like Kristen was saying, like, you know, if you have a couple of influencers on a campaign, are they going to get along? Is their content going to be similar? You know, what influencers are influencing other influencers? So, so many things to consider on that. Um, so as part of that, um, what are measurements for success um, and how do they often differ from brands? So how do you approach personal success as a creator and um, partnership success as a professional? So if a brand comes to you, Matt Manon, and says like, oh, I need this much reach, I need this much engagement, that's fine, that's the brand side, but to you, what is success for a campaign or a video or a piece of content? I know for me, I don't, often get approached with, we need to reach this number. It's more so you see my, my channels already, you see my engagement, you see my content, and just have fun with it, make it organic, make, make it you, and the audience will, will receive it and, and will like it. So um, to be honest, if I was approached with just numbers, it might be a campaign that I don't want to work with because right. I want to do something very organic that I like for my audience. Mm -hmm. And there's pl I don't mind turning down a brand if it doesn't fit either. It's not always about um, getting paid to do 
to do that content. I want my page to, to be me, and if something's gonna change, uh, change that, then I'll, I just won't participate. So that's great. So like if you had a, a Vine video and it was branded content, to yourself personally, are you thinking like it needs to get so many loops for me personally to think it was successful, or is it, or like how do you, I I've, kind of you know what I just it's just it's not based on the numbers necessarily even though the numbers can come into play I I, I get that but I think it's just doing a good job creating just quality content like for that for that brand yeah me okay. liking it my friends liking it like obviously sometimes branded posts even if your audience knows it's branded they don't sometimes want to like it yeah. that happens but you're it's in front of the same amount of people yeah and um and they see it and you know you can tell what resonates yeah. well with your audience yeah it makes sense yeah for me i i agree and um it definitely can't be about the numbers it's for me it, i have an internal compass of what i feel is successful you know there's videos there's branded content that i've done where you know it's good and i'm surprised by the numbers mm -hmm. and how well they are and then there's stuff that i think is gold and it's like well that stuff's out of our control you know it's right. according to the time it's posted or you know, sometimes, and that's another thing with the brands, it's like they want it their specific time, and it's like, well, I'm suggesting that it should be right. at this time, and they're sticking with that, and then I'm like, oh, they didn't listen, and then the numbers aren't what they probably want, right. and it can't be about the numbers, because sometimes, I'll, you know, I'll have a video that like has like, you know, 200,000 loops, and another one that has 400,000 loops, but the one that has less loops has like 11,000 comments, yeah. so it's engaged, and right. people are commenting, and it's like, okay, that's that's a measure of success, right. and so for me, I just, I can't really go off of numbers, because that's out of my control, really. Right. It has to be about, yeah, the yeah. content, and how much fun we're having making it, and how close it is to brand, our sure. brand. Yeah. One of my favorite videos I've ever done I get the most love on the streets from people saying that video was hilarious, and I'm like, really? Because I love it, and I didn't get that. I didn't get that feedback from my audience. But there's, a, there was a market for it. So no matter what you put out, let's just say, um, I have a lot of people who follow me that are younger that might not drive a, drive a car, so they won't, they won't get a, a car joke. But adults will. So if I'm doing something for Toyota, if and it doesn't get the love from everybody, but there's a, there's a, you know, a nice percentage that would understand that adult joke, mm -hmm. you know, or right. because it had to do with driving a car and some people just don't know what that would be. Right. So it, the content still reaches a, a large audience no matter what. And um, I just think that in general, working, working based on just what numbers you can hit is not the right idea for an organic collaboration. Because it Absolutely. has the wrong intention. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Trust me, like from an agency standpoint, we work with brands on a consistent basis showing that you know it's not always about the numbers and you know the collaboration and co-collaboration with the content creating the right content is what's going to make sense and make you know their consumers excited about it and then your fans excited about it too mm -hmm. so and just like a you know a tv ad it's like you really don't know what how it's affecting the exactly. audience and so yeah. even if people aren't pushing the like button yep you don't know how whether or not they like the video our unconscious mind is taking in the right. information and they're seeing that, that, that man is attached to such and such and that will cause some sort of, yeah. like who knows what's really happening mm -hmm. when yeah. people are watching the... Yeah, they may not have clicked to purchase in that moment, but they may have thought about it the Wednesday after yeah. and bought it at Target or yep. something, you know what yeah, I mean, because yeah. they saw that video. So that's a really good point. So I've always found it interesting. They're like, well, what are the numbers? Like, well, when yeah. TV ads, you have no idea exactly. what, if they're fast forward, yeah. you know. Yeah, or like print ads, like if they're yeah. looking through stuff, it's like, you can't really tell. Yeah. Um, Kristen, is there, um, you know, that's kind of the, on the influencer side, um, you know, from our agency and brand side, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on um, the success of campaigns and reporting? I think I can Additional just, information? I kind of just, the stuff that we have, uh, the gist? Just touching on that, but, it's perfect. but I will say that we, we also do traditionally uh, survey for awareness and intent of purchase yeah. um, and, and can attribute that to social and influencer. Um, that's not always the, the best method, but it's one, one method that we use that you know, if people are interested in seeing that um, impact from the programs that we do, we do that as well. So now it's time to talk about everyone's favorite topic when we talk about creators, FTC disclosures. Is everyone familiar in the audience with FTC disclosures so we can just hit the ground running? Pretty much. I'll just give a little, a little summary. <laughs> um, so the FTC requires that 
influencers um, disclose when they're being paid for the content they're creating. Um, it's pretty gray, um, so a lot of brands, agencies, and influencers um, kind of struggle with how they do that. Um, but most of the time you'll see like hashtag ads, hashtag sponsored in a social post. Um, so with that said, um, so within the last year, the FTC has been cracking down on brands that require influencers they partner with to disclose paid partnerships. Um, how do you approach disclosures to ensure it's clear to your audience that the content you're creating is sponsored by a brand, but you're still keeping that authenticity? I mean, it also depends on what the brand's requirements are. Sometimes they tell you straight up, you have to do hashtag ad. Yeah. Sometimes they say you have to do hashtag sponsored. Um, sometimes they want you to say in partnership with. Um, mm. That's usually not up to us. Um, you, you fit it into the caption, and if the content's good, it just speaks for itself. Yeah. So I, I don't mind it. If I'm proud of a video, I don't mind putting an ad on it. Um, but it's not really up to us how we do it for the most part. And have you seen any pushback or negative comments um, or positive comments, you know, when you're, when you're putting this in there, has it affected your content at all? Honestly, I think when I first started, when influencers first started doing branded posts and it started becoming a bigger thing, mm -hmm. you're, uh, there are so many like haters online that just want to talk crap about anything. Yeah. Whether or not you literally change the color of your hair or if you're, you know, if with me and Manon's video on me trying to kiss her and she doesn't want me to kiss her or whatever it is, they have something to say about everything. So if they see ad, they get the chance to say sell out and whatever. That kind of has passed. Yeah. Now they're just used to it being like, this is my form of entertainment. This is my television show that I get to watch on my phone. And it, one in every five videos, I get to watch an entertaining ad. And I think the best thing about that, that I, that I do get, I've seen you know, a lot of people get it, is just like, wow, this is a great ad. And it's cool to see that. Yeah, yeah. I think they've given up that whole, you know, that was a few years ago where at first it was really hard to take in. I, I think for a lot of viewers not realizing that we weren't getting paid for creating content on a daily basis and this was our source of income and we do make it fun and we do like it. And yeah, that moment has passed and people have become more accepting because it was a new thing. Mm -hmm. Like just even social media was really like, especially Vine, it was like brand new. And so now it's like, okay, they get it. They've accepted it just as, you know, a lot of people have accepted, you know, Alec Baldwin doing such and such, or <laughs> people are like, all right, whatever. But right. at first they're like, no, because it's, you know. Right. But this only, that's the way we get to keep creating. Yeah. Right. I guess it's cool because it, it truly has passed. That, that has definitely passed to where if you post something branded now and the quality's there, people don't care. They'll, they'll watch it as a skit and see the, see the car plug or the cell phone plug and, mm -hmm. and they like it. And it's becoming more mainstream where more mm -hmm. creators are, are posting it. I know in conversations that we've had with um, additional creators that we've worked with, you know, it's very similar similar to what you said, man. And like their true fans are like, absolutely, you should be getting paid. Like, good. I hope you got a check, you know, because I want you to continue to create good content. And, you know, true fans understand the time it takes to create ideas and then to actually shoot it and then post production and everything else. So um, that's exciting. Yeah, you'll here. get people be like oh sell out and then you'll get the next person being like she's not a sell out she does the like I'm like I don't have to stick up yeah, for myself exactly the Some people that, yeah. that will that will do yeah. that and I think the beauty of it too is if you're partnering with the right brand in the right way it's seamless right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. even if it says hashtag ad it's okay because it's I would expect to see man and you know with that brand doing that like I'm, I'm excited to see that so yeah. that's great um, so now we're going to transition to kind of emerging platforms and beyond. So with so many social platforms, apps, and technologies available for influencers to share content with their fans, what do you see as either the next big thing that you want to start using or a current tool that you want to leverage more and how? I guess I have a current tool that I want to leverage more and I haven't done anything on YouTube. I know everyone else has. It's one, uh, it's one platform I haven't really focused on yet, but now that I'm getting more into doing longer formatted stuff, I'm going to start doing YouTube. I know it's, that's like been one of the first ones, but it's a newer one to me. Nice. Yeah, I recently got a following on Facebook and that's been super fun because all the other platforms were, there was a certain age range where it was like teens, which is great, but Facebook, you know, everybody has Facebook and mm -hmm. it's a wider range. Uh, platform and I've been doing Facebook live videos as of really recently which has made me in turn want to do like a 
vlog on YouTube because that's the one thing where it's actually the only monetized thing and it would be fun and like just a whole other thing of because we've always wanted to do long form which is why we were so happy that um, Instagram expanded and Vine yeah. expanded and Facebook expanded mm -hmm. and so I think YouTube is something that I definitely want to jump on and I definitely want to nurture my Facebook uh, fan page as well. That's awesome. Okay, I'm going to ask a question, then we'll open it up for Q&A. So you've both been in the space for a while. So what would you advice would you give to aspiring influencers or people that want to start creating content, especially young kids that are seeing the phenomenon and want to jump in? I, I would say just to, to stay true to yourself, what you think is funny and what you want to do. Not everyone's going to relate to it. I know that I built my following based on a more mature audience. Um, so a lot of people call it like more adult humor. Uh, there's a whole um, range of more successful, if you want to call it that, based on numbers, a, a large group that has a massive large teenage following. But that's something that I don't want to conform to just to gain more of an audience. So I think staying true to yourself and what you think is funny is it will gain you a solid fan base that won't leave you. Great. And I know for me, um, that definitely was not my intention going into it. I didn't go on Vine to like gain a following. I actually had no idea that that was even a possibility in my life. So if you can make yourself laugh and if you can tickle yourself and have fun, naturally the world responds to it in a really good way. We all just want to see people enjoying themselves. You know what I mean? And we can see the difference. And I think, you know, for Matt and I, when we get to play together, we are laughing so much that people want to enjoy that and they want to be part of that world. And I think that's how, you know, I got a following in the first place. I think that's how a lot of the people did is they were just enjoying themselves and having fun and staying true to themselves and continuing to do that and not changing and not having the intention be to get more followers because that's kind of an ill-formed goal you know so I've always kept my goal mm -hmm. to just like keep having fun keep making yourself laugh because that's really all we have the control to do anyway great questions from the audience yeah I have a question of how all these bits work so you're golden mm -hmm. the clients come to you and then you hire the influencers or do you have clients that come to you and you just deliver and then when you say post who posts so I'll take the goal and the ego. So it works differently for different people. You've heard a lot about programmatic. That's one way. We have our, our IQS filter. Typically, our clients will come to us and they want to amplify a campaign. Like maybe there's a holiday campaign or a car launch or something like that. You can get a larger brand awareness for your campaign when you work with influencers and you create engaging content. So we um, go through our rigor and our process. We look at the fit with the influencer and the brand, and then we reach out to them. There's different ways that influencers are working. Some are working with MCNs, some with agents, and it, or some on their own. It just depends where they are sort of in the life cycle of their career. Um, and then we reach out and we start a dialogue, and it's just pretty casual, like, hey, we're, we've got this brand interested in working with you. There's a creative brief. Um, and then I'll let you elaborate on the, the yeah, process so of then, the contracts. Yeah, so then if it, if it works out and they're on board and the timing um, matches, then you go into like a contract phase usually. Um, that goes back and forth between the two teams. Um, and then you set a work back schedule. Um, the influencer will then create the content. It then pretty much goes back and forth for approvals. Um, and then it posts. So posts can be anything from um, the content they create living on their social media channels, or it can be content they created for the brand to live on the brand social media channels, or both. And we post it generally. Yeah. You post. We do. Yeah. yeah. To their channels. And then we share it on the client's owned channel. Can share it. And so you get a double bump from and that. In terms of ROI, when you're saying point of purchase, like, where's that? So it depends what the content is. So YouTube, it can be at the end of a video, and they can say, hey, click in the link, and you click through. Um, sometimes it's a link in the comments. Um, Instagram, you can have the link in your bio, like to buy. So it just depends on the platform that it's on. It's still very much about engagement, engaging with your brand right now. It's, we're pretty nascent. It's where social ROI is coming into play. 
So, but you're seeing more of it as, as social matures. You have a question? So it actually is all over the place because you have different layers of influencers and it's appropriate for different brands. So maybe it's a, a mom um, blogger campaign where they want high touch mom bloggers, very targeted. And so they want to go with mass appeal. And so you're hiring several. We did a campaign for Universal where we were looking at pet influencers and they had highly engaged followers and the pets themselves, it's crazy, did as well. Um, to, you know, YouTube stars, Viners, it really depends. It's all over the place, to be honest. And it's usually a fee and um, and it's a negotiation process. So it really, it really depends. And um, Depends what the brand fit too, and is this their hero campaign, and there's only one influencer, or is there 20? So. So it's a fee to the influencer, and then we have a, a fee agency fee, and. Um, and so it's, it's almost like a paid buy, a media buy. So if you look at the work to place an ad and then the, the out-of-pocket costs would be the influencer fee. So think of it that way. Yeah. And, uh, and that's primarily based on the time it takes to negotiate. And so that, that's the basis for the agency fee um, down to the hour. And I think that's an important point that people don't recognize right now is that it truly is art and science because more and more people are, are sophisticated. They want engaging content. They want to match for the brand. So it really is looking through all these filters and saying, is this going to give our clients the biggest bang for the buck? And more than that, is the creators that we're working with going to be creating authentic content that really drives the campaign home and amplifies the message of the brand? So um, it's, there, it's a lot of, there's a long process involved in it that I think would surprise people. And then just working to make it a, a fit. Yep. I think um, Manon kind of answered that earlier with like not expecting what was going to happen when we when we both started on Vine. I know my launch was was your launch on Vine as well, as yeah. far as the bigger social media launch. Um, there was no expectation. I, I got on there for fun. I was working at a restaurant at the time. I was filming stuff in the kitchen with uh, with the staff and like just doing some fun stuff, and it just grew and it grew based on me being myself and goofing around and people. Um, seeing like, man, this guy really doesn't care what he looks like in front of his audience. So it grew in front of like from 10,000 to 20,000 to, you know, 1.9 million on Vine from just not really caring and just, and just being true to myself and posting. So um, as far as self-doubt, I didn't expect anything. So there was nothing to doubt in the first place for me. Yeah. I, and uh, I remember getting on Vine and just... Make, I made like 60 vines before I had like even 30 followers. I was just doing it. If I if I would have known, I wouldn't have made them because <laughs> I'm like not wearing any makeup. I'm making the ugliest faces. Like I was clearly just in self amusement. Um, but you know, and someone commented like, "Hey, I, I saw your set at the comedy store and you did a Kristen Stewart impression. Can you throw that up there?" And I was like, "Sure, I'll do that for this guy." And that night I had 10,000 followers and within a week was 100,000 and of course that propelled me to like, oh gosh, now I really have to make stuff every day, which is great. It lit, you know, a fire under my butt and uh, <laughs> it, I, and then, you know, collaborating with other people. It, it wasn't necessarily the intention to like, oh, I got to grow my following. It was, oh, there's other people that are doing what I'm doing with around the same following and how fun that we get to, you know, because I definitely had opportunities to collaborate with people who had millions and millions and millions 
um, but it didn't naturally feel organic to me. I wanted, I, and then we, I, we found our little group of people that kind of got it and got to play, and of course it kind of spread because our followers would overlap. And so the, yeah, the intention wasn't necessarily like, I gotta get more followers. It was just, I, for me, it was like, I wanna keep playing and have more fun and have other ideas and, and yeah. Can I just add to that? You know, there are three kind of three different buckets that we look into in terms of influencers to work with, and that would be you know just entertaining, um, and the other one would be uh, authoritative, informative um, about something in particular, and then the third is is having a dedicated passion area. So if there's something that uh, you know you want to be known for and you love really pursuing that and being you know having that be your main thing um, you know those are kind of three different directions to go into that all work and I'll just add one more thing to that and then we've got another question um, remember also that it's there's a science to it so like what's your category so Instagram is big for fashion and so, you know, it's also a match for your content within the category and the platform. Are, are you going to do long form um, video? So, um, you know, YouTube, Facebook Live is great. Huge engagement numbers on Facebook Live and, and Facebook video in general. So it's, it's almost like a strategy for what is your brand and how are you going to take it out there and the content you're going to create on the right platforms. It's going to give you the biggest engagement and also amplification of, of your content. So, all right, we have a question here. I, I just am fascinated by this. I have kids your age who, <laughs> who, who are, um, I mean, it's just, you know, when you're not a digital native and you, you see what's exploded and you see here as a business we're going, it's like this is a new line I can budget in virtually every brand. It is. It's the social growth, is the social connection, you know. And you go to the Super Bowl. I mean, I can see that's a multi generation Is this, I mean, I think it's a phenomenon but that is real mm -hmm. and that is going to be forever now. This is a new line item budget for every brand. Um, do you, is this a job for you now? Like, is this all you do? And are you <laughs> actively, and I don't want to make this, authenticity is everything, you know, and it's like, if you've gone to this conference at all, there's all this talk about data, data, data. It's a story-driven, entertainment is about story and narrative and authenticity, truly. You know, machines and data is really not gonna pick the next 10 hit movies or TV shows like it's all gonna pick. So when you're thinking about, like you said, a brand didn't feel like it was really you, your sense of comedy, your sense of identity, like how closely think about this, if this is, I think, your job, are you thinking, oh, I, I have this great idea for Ford, I have this great idea for CoverGirl, or I have this, you know, great idea for a party, and, and who wants to go to a party, and, you know, go to a party store that we could represent, I could represent. I mean, how close are you to that, or is it really just, if they call you, they call you, it's very just, you know, whatever happens. That's actually a good question. So do you guys pitch brands? Uh, well, first of all, I love your energy. <laughs> um, second of all, it's totally a job, but it's, it's the best one ever. I mean, Matt and I joke around when we're making videos. We're like, oh, we have to work on a Friday. Like, because we just love it so much. And um, for me, yes, brands will come and, you know, I'll pick the ones that I feel good about and, and feel like I can work well with, as well as, you know, you know talking to my manager and being like, I really want to, work for this campaign because I'm really passionate about this and I've already you know we've we'll like unconsciously do brands like you know I'll have like Starbucks in my thing and be like I love Starbucks any less organic. no right? not at all that's of who you are and mm -hmm. if you can connect that makes it even better mm -hmm. it's like you really are, are loving something it's like yeah <laughs> it's very interesting too because sometimes brands will come because they realize that you love it um, I got a Starbucks campaign because I would always talk about loving coffee, needing coffee in the morning, here's my Starbucks, here's this. And then Starbucks reached out to my management um, and was like, we want Matt for Starbucks. He clearly loves coffee, so this will just be natural. 
So I did a, I did a few different uh, campaigns for them, and, and it was ama- my audience loved it because it was me. So I think it's also smart for brands to, to notice those kind of things. And so it, could be a, it could be a guy who's super into trucks. You know, it, it doesn't matter what it is, but I think brands should, should also note that kind of stuff as well. That is one of the first things that we do when we get started is mm-hmm. if we're working for Toyota, who's already who's already following, who's already talking to Toyota, because there's a pretty big field out there and we need to narrow it. And if there is an authentic love for the brand in any way, you know, get on the list and then, and then we'll see if it really works. And to speak to the... Um, social, social media analytics <laughs> tools. Social tools. Yeah. Social listening. I'm going to take a couple more questions. I will just say to your um, question, data is just a part of digital. So that's one thing. People use it differently for different means, but we all use it. Um, and then I think it is, you know, the new norm. You know, YouTube, there's, I think it's the broadcast and the breaking down of barriers so that, you know, it will just continue to evolve with people broadcasting themselves and their lives and an audience out there because they can. So you have a question? Yes, I have a question for you guys. Um, how did you, it sounds like you both work with managers and agents. How did you go about finding one? How did that relationship start and develop? I just grabbed Matt's manager. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> No, like, you, I mean, they, you know, they reached out, and I've had experiences way in the beginning where I was definitely taken advantage of, and I don't know how legit it was, and I probably have a lot of money out there that didn't come to me, and you, I mean, I don't know, you have to kind of go through word of mouth, I, you see companies, and you find out, for me, I found my, one of my first agents was, I, I had friends that worked with them, and then I didn't, I, it was like, seemed legitimate, and then you just kind of build and evolve as a creator, and you know, because I remember my first brand was like a month in and getting paid at all was like, what? And so I kind of would take any rate and it's evolved yep. into like realizing how much work we are putting into it. You know, there, we're the writer, director, actor. We have to do everything. You know, we're basically building our own commercial. Mm-hmm. In front of our audience. Yeah. Of, of millions of people. So it's, it, it, there is a value behind it. And I also was taking advantage at first when uh, I got my first manager. And I had no idea until... Um, I found out from another agency who was paying the management company and they asked about this job and like literally over dinner money the money amount came up and I was like wait what they're like yeah we paid you this much for this campaign I was like what about that other campaign so I had over um, twelve thousand dollars taken from without knowing from my first management so that's when this first started and I wasn't sure what to do and it was just like yeah I'm getting paid this of course Um, but then you you know Years of doing this, word of mouth, friends who have good managers, and yeah. now I have one of the best in the business. Jack Reed, shout out. Jack, Thanks for all your hard work. <laughs> yeah, I have separate. I'm an actress, so I have an, uh, right. you know commercial agent, a theatrical agent, and then I have a separate yeah, manager. Exactly. For social media yeah they're separate and that's something that from an agency side that we deal with too when we go after an influencer they may have a talent management they may have a multi-channel network that manages their channel I mean they may have so a lawyer they may have so many different people so it's trying to find the right person you know to get to the influencer first to see if they're even interested and if they are are we talking to the right person to make sure we're paying them the money so that the influencer actually gets the money so that's something to consider too Inkin, you have a question Did you say multi-channel network? What, yeah. Can you allow, what? You know, like, like a company, a company that basically aggregates uh, people's um, content into a thematic channel and monetize, helps them monetize the channel. So I think, she, no, no, I think they know what MCNs are. They just want to know, um, do you guys work with an MCN or what are your thoughts about being part of an MCN, like maker, full screen, that type of thing? Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm with Collab, I don't know who you're with, but also Collab. So we're both with Collab. And are you asking, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Are you asking? You know what? 
I don't think it's a starting point. I think once you've built, you've built a following and an audience, then they come to you and say, hey, we noticed that your work's ending up on YouTube and we want to you know, start collecting your royalties that are owed to you. We also, um, at Collab Studios, who we're with, for example, um, we offer studio space. We can help, you know, we can help um, your YouTube page. We can help it grow. So I think it, it's not a first step thing. In fact, I'm not sure if they'd even sign someone if, you know, as, a, as a starter. Um, but it, it happens eventually. I feel like it was. Yeah. 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 It, it, I, I've been in the business around influencer for like five years, and back then, um, nothing like what it was today. And you know, back then, it, I feel like creators probably really needed MCNs, but MCNs are even evolving. Um, a lot of them becoming more like studios and creating different type of you know ways for them to engage with influencers. And so, kind of to Matt's point. Um, a lot of them, from the ones that we work with, prefer to hear from the agency or brand directly, um, and then they have their team of people, and then they can, you know, speak with them. Any other questions? It's, it's definitely in the thousands. I feel like a good I feel like a good starting point if you have really good quality content is maybe like twenty thousand. That's just yeah. that's just a guess. That's kind of where it starts with you know getting a few hundred dollars here to post. Um, but I that's a good question. I don't know from an agency standpoint what that would. Well, I think it's also important to know you could have a hundred thousand followers, but a small percentage of those people are actually engaging with your content and maybe only have like. You know, someone else has 5,000 followers, but like the majority of their audience is engaging. So from an agency standpoint, in addition to, you know, all the work that Kristen um, kind of does in helping look for influencers, engagement is really key. So it's not just how big you are, um, because people can buy their followers and fans. Um, and so that skews the numbers too. And so we have benchmarks per channel per category, so, and it all rolls up into this IQS filter that Kristen was talking about. So, question up front. I was wondering, um, could you talk about the YouTube Red movies that they're now doing? Is that something you guys want to be in? I know since they're doing a lot of these movies with populating them with all the uh, these influencers and various murder mysteries or capers and just all these big billboards on some simple board. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did do that. I, I, I shot a project for YouTube Red called Single by 30 in April, and it, it aired, and it, it was such a gift because, I, you know, I was an actress, you know, doing okay, but really working on getting my name out there, um, you know, trying just for myself, and I know that having a social media platform has had more eyes, and cast directors have seen me, and I've done, you know, multiple projects, you know, on TV or commercials or whatever, and YouTube Red as well because people recognized me from Vine and wanted to bring me in and it's been such a door opening thing and you know I think I think YouTube Red I'm not really sure how it's how well it's doing right now but I, I it's fun seeing a lot of the social you know influencers you know doing on bigger screen stuff and I know for me it felt like a big leap to be in a project like that as a series regular in a YouTube Red show because I think it's like a it's kind of like Netflix, the paid, paid programming yeah, like for YouTube. Video on demand, You'll yeah. get better content if you go on YouTube Red. Yeah. Right, and then, I think last year, E! Entertainment did a show with one that, one that was a big social media phenomenon, and they gave her like a half hour uh, sitcom type show on E! Oh, Grace, how big? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last year. Right. And that's a, that's a whole another panel and conversation, but it does kind of get to your question of, um, you know, influencers that do really well on social channels, how well, you know, do they port they over to on TV and movies, you know, are their fans going and watching as well? I don't know if you guys have anything else. I have, I'm just saying it's a whole other panel. Yeah, <laughs> I have one more question. Can you talk about the collaboration process yeah. with, with other influencers, not only working together yourselves, but 
just is there people you see that you don't know and you reach out to them and, and what that does for your channels? I actually think it's very interesting that just like the movie world where um, Brad Pitt knows who Rachel McAdams is mm -hmm. and they might want to work on a project together. It's the same sort of thing where we've we're part of such a small percentage of people who have made careers out of being entertainers on social media that we all kind of know who each other are. So without even thinking about it, if I, like, the, like King Batch, he's, he's uh, one of the biggest entertainers. I, I didn't know who he was personally. He didn't know who I was personally, but I saw him I'm like, Batch, he's like, Kusho, what up? And like, we know each other. So I feel like there are, in our small percentage of people, we all kind of all do know each other. And sometimes you write a skit that you think might be good for, um, for King Batch, for example. I thought something was really cool with him, so I literally direct messaged him. He wrote back, we exchanged numbers, and I went to his house and we shot something. Nice. So that's kind of how it happened. I think Manon reached out to me on Vine, right? And she, you DM me on Vine, I think? I'm pretty sure you reached out to me. Really? <laughs> oh. Yeah, you did. It went either way. It went down in the DMs. It went down in the DM. <laughs> and, um, and then we were, we were a fan of each other. And what's funny is, too, M Manon was, was, you were pretty big at the time. I think you had like 500,000 followers. Was huge. She was a big deal. <laughs> and then I, only, I probably had like 100,000, but she thought I was so cute and charming. And she was like, hey. <laughs> Want to collab? But no, like for instance, we, we legit met because we knew each other through social media. So then she was like, I don't, you already lived in LA. I had, um, Anyway, that, that doesn't matter. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> we don't need the whole backstory. Um, but yeah, that's funny. Like, now we have a friendship and a working relationship, and that just came from knowing who each other were through social media and just as simple as a direct message, and, and it, works, it, it works just like that. Yeah, and, and uh, I know what's exciting is, you know, I love our, we have, like, this group of people, and for, I made a feature film two and a half years ago called Holiday Breakup, and I got to bring my people in it. You know what I mean? And Jason Nash just had a movie come out called FML, and he used his group. It's like the Apatos mm -hmm. and the Adam Sandlers that like stick with the same group because people like to feel like they're part of something. And we have our group, whether it's just Matt and I, or you know, Rye and Matt, Jason and Brandon. It's like we all like to put each other and cast each other and what we think like they'll fit in, and naturally that grows and people become connected, and it feels. Like I know for Matt and I, a lot of times people feel like they're watching a TV show, you know, and they're like they yeah. get really invested in the characters, mm -hmm. you know, which is great to include our friends and you know creation. And your fans expect it, so it's, it's yeah, it's good. It's familiar faces, so yeah, it's great. Question. Brand loyalty to us? Yeah. Um, I guess, you know what? It, so f earlier I was mentioning that I worked with a brand for a campaign for the last six months. And I think the, the loyalty is there, and I'm doing a good job for them, and, and they're really easy to work with. And whether or not they're going to pay more or less than, than another brand, I would stick with the brand that I like working with the most, to be honest. Yeah. Like, because th it does fluctuate. Like, not every single job pays the same, but there's sometimes you'll take a lower cut for a brand you've already worked with or a brand that fits your, fits your personal brand better. And when we're looking for influencers for a brand campaign, we certainly make sure that they're not working with a competitive brand. Oh, yeah. And we don't want to so go, we don't want to do that. Yeah. yeah. We don't yeah. want to go against the brand we're already working with. We prefer to just stick with the brand that we are working with continually. Question? Open are you, or is this really just part of your platform in helping your audience discover new things, like a new artist, recording artist, or something you know that is really brand new that isn't a brand? It seems like your platforms are perfect for discovery, which could make you so powerful. I just is that I'm sure that's in the mix, um, but how much is it depends if it's. If it's an artist I believe in, then I'll just post about it just because I want to. It's, I don't need to get paid to post for something like that. Um, I'm, I've been reached out by many musicians that said, hey, can you post this song for me? And my label will cut a check. If it's something I don't agree with, I'm just not going to post it. And if it's something that I like, if it's like an artist, I'll just do it. Because I'm like, you, you're really, you're really cool and I'll, and I'll help support this. Um, that's, that's me and at least. Someone, you know what? Someone did that for me when they revined my impression. So I have to think about like, I didn't 
I didn't do this. It was, you know, the universal energy. I'm very spiritual about all of that and how it comes to fruition. And yeah, you gotta give back and shout out. Any other questions? Oh. Um, for me, it's most days, to be honest. Most days, I, I, I get an email about it. Uh, I know I put um, now on my Instagram link at least, it goes directly to my management, so he, he deals with a lot of that. But still, my Gmail, every other day, I'm still getting random brands and, um, and artists and people reaching out, which I don't even know how they have that but it still happens. I was just going to ask one last question. Sure. Does Golan, all right, do you have a traditional PR department as well? We do, so just as everything has evolved, um, they uh, started 60 years ago, we started 60 years ago with McDonald's as our client, um, with Al Golan, who um, met Ray Kroc. And, um, and it's evolved since then, just as media, and you're seeing overlapping. So now a huge percentage of our business is digital marketing, social media, social listening. We do a lot of live war rooms. Um, so for instance, with our Nintendo client, we will run a, a live social war room during E3, and then real-time analytics around that. And um, yeah, so I think our core is really digital content. Um, PR, and then influencer marketing. And finding ways to have 360 campaigns with all of those. So they make mm -hmm. sense, yeah. Great, well I'd like to thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.